So what are five cloud storage providers that are dirt cheap? Four of them you haven't heard about, one of them I bet you have. Let's talk about it. So welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider, where we talk about the realities of cloud computing and how to make it work for your enterprise. I'm your host, Dave Linthicum, author, speaker, b geek. Let's get into the topic. So this is going to be a bit of a fun one because uh, I, you know, got I get this question all the time. Are, are there any uh, more economical cloud providers that are out there uh, that enterprises can leverage now that they see that uh, you know the cost of cloud, including compute and storage and databases, things like that, uh, is exploding, and so they're looking to economize a bit. And in other words, look at other cloud storage options if they need cloud storage that will do the job, but also do the job for less money. So I looked at a couple of the providers out there and looked at the affordable options, and I was kind of stunned with uh, some providers out there I've never heard about, um, maybe a few you have, and one that I did hear about, that were really the cheaper options. You have to remember that cloud storage is very important to enterprises. It's kind of how cloud computing first got started. We started with AWS S3, and there were other cloud storage options out there as well. I don't think they were the first one to the market. But the ability to leverage different kinds of storage, object storage, block storage, file storage, things like that as a service, was something that was valuable to enterprises because they were spending a lot of money and time on managing their own physical storage systems that exist in the data centers. So, you know, Born was cloud storage, and it's been around ever since. And also Born were the big cloud providers that provide cloud storage, namely AWS, Microsoft, and Google. But of course, there's you know Ali, Alibaba, there's uh, Ali Cloud, uh, Oracle, IBM, and a few other you know big players out there as well. So it's interesting to watch the market kind of emerge. We already talked about micro clouds, and I'll go ahead and link to that video up here, uh, and how that is kind of a force to be reckoned with in the cloud computing world. And these are small cloud providers that provide niche services. Uh, sometimes they're sovereign clouds. They only support a single country. But in many instances, they may be a better choice uh, for uh, economic reasons and optimization reasons for many enterprises, and therefore they, sh they should be considered, even though they're lesser known brands. So cloud storage has kind of grown up over the years. And I think we saw, like I said, the major cloud providers were providing storage. And kind of what happened in the market, we had dozens and dozens of cloud providers out there. Remember 2008, 2009, I was tracking a bunch of them. Every telecom company had a cloud uh, they were selling. Uh, every software company had a cloud. And everybody was trying to compete in the market. But of course, the market normalized. People realized early on that it was going to take billions of dollars to maintain a cloud infrastructure and points of presence and data centers all over the world, things like that. So it was normalized to AWS, Microsoft, um, and Google that were the three providers that most enterprises leveraged. And of course, they provided storage services, but also database services and compute services, things like that. And so they became the cloud providers of choice, uh, not only because they provided the storage services, which was kind of uh, uh, table stakes for the cloud computing world, but lots of other services on top of it. So in other words, there's one-stop shopping for many enterprises uh, that are looking to leverage uh, public cloud providers, and that provided them with some success. So here we are about to move into 2025, and uh, everybody is seeing their cloud bills these days. <laughs> And it's a lot more than they thought it was going to be. As I wrote about in my book and mentioned a bunch of times here, it was to 2.5 times the uh, amount uh, people are spending on, on public cloud providers than they initially thought they were. And so the expectations were uh, here. They ended up spending here. And so in a, a logical way, they're asking for other alternatives that may provide uh, similar cloud services. Um maybe even just a particular niche cloud service, such as storage and compute. And certainly we have GPU-based services for the AI world that are starting to emerge these days and do so at a less expensive price. So I took it upon myself to go look at the marketplace and see what are the top five less expensive, sometimes I get I almost free, <laughs> cloud storage options out there we can leverage. So 
uh, obviously I'm, I'm, there's a spreadsheet that I'm going to, I created on Google. So I'm going to link that in the description. So you can take a look there to get a lot of the details that I'm going to talk about here. And I'll throw up some charts uh, on the screen as well. Uh, and so let's go through them. So first would be ice drive. Uh, they provide, uh, a security with, uh, encryption, user friendly interface. They provide affordable pricing, uh, they have uh, encrypted based systems. They, they tout their security capabilities and the targeted users would be individual users and small businesses that prioritize cost and security over, you know, using a brand name cloud ice drive. And so all the links will be in the description as well. You can take a look at all these folks. Sync.com, which was focused on privacy with zero knowledge encryption. They have file versioning, key features, Strong encryption, of course. They are able to give you five gigabytes free storage, easy file sharing, and their target users, according to them, are going to be individuals and small teams looking for privacy-focused solutions. So a lot of these things have the common patterns that they provide less expensive storage, but they also provide encryption services as well, understanding that in many instances that uh, people are okay with storing stuff on the cloud, but as long as they can encrypt them and and hold the key so people can get out there and read them. Even the cloud providers themselves uh, can't read the encrypted stuff uh, since they don't have your key. You have the key to your data and you, you can put it on their system. It's physically stored on their system, but only you can see it if you have the encryption key. Uh, next would be P Cloud, uh, small p, capital C, cloud. Uh, descript they provide fast synchronization and virtual uh, drive features with they have flexible pricing plans key features that they tout would be fast sync uh, op uh, optional crypto folder and added security again the security theme again lifetime plan target users would be users preferring a fast and sync fast sync features with uh, optimal security upgrades next would be mega all caps m-a-g-a -A. Um, their description they're known for Free storage and end-to-end -end encryption again. Again, low-cost storage with encryption. Uh, they have security features, decryption standards. You're able to get 20 gigabytes of free storage. That's pretty generous. Uh, targeted users are security-conscious users needing ample free storage. So up, up to now, I bet you many of you haven't heard about those cloud providers. And, and by the way, they have different points of presence. We'll talk about the trade-offs in a minute. And then finally, the one you have heard of would be Google Drive. Uh, they're part of the Google Workspace suite offering, integration collaboration tools, and the key features would be seamless integration with Google Apps, robust collaboration features. And it was surprising to me that they were so cheap. I hadn't looked at the prices in a long period of time. So they got on the list. Uh, obviously, AWS and Microsoft isn't on the list, and we'll go over the differences in prices of those uh, in a bit. But it was, uh, you know, kind of interesting to me that Google has a very uh, competitive, very economical storage system. And their target users are going to be users and teams already integrated with the Google ecosystem. So they're not using looking to sell storage unto itself, uh, even though they will do that. But they're looking to provide a storage system that's integrated with uh, their uh, collaboration suite, their collaboration tools, their emails and you know, we, we Google Sheets and Google Docs and you know, all the things people use in productivity tools. And of course, they're a competitor with uh, Microsoft 365. So all that's pretty interesting. So what do these things cost? Well, I'll put the chart up, up here. You can take a look at yourself and also link in the description. Uh, Sync.com is going to be $8 for two terabytes a year plan. Uh, and I have the cost per gigabyte price is 0 .00400. Um, so it's pretty cheap. Uh, Ice Drive, they're going to be $5.99 for one terabyte a year plan, and their cost per gigabyte is going to be uh, .00599, uh, also economically um, attractive. P Cloud would be $8.33 uh, $8 for their year plan for two terabytes, and their cost per gigabyte is going to be .00417. Um, still haven't beat Sync, Sync yet. And then Google Drive, eight point three three, sorry, eight dollars and thirty three cents a year, which is pretty much the same as P Cloud, and uh, they're um, providing a very similar gigabyte price at point zero zero four one seven. And then uh, Mega uh, would be nine dollars and six cents for a two terabyte per year, and their cost for gigab gigabyte is going to be zero zero four five three. 
Uh, and again, the features are there, the pros and the cons, uh, the websites where you can get them at, uh, things like that are going to be in the description. Again, these are the prices that I was quoted at the time of making this video. So if you're watching this in a year, these are obviously going to be different, uh, higher or lower. It doesn't matter. So you're getting it for, you're getting the prices based on what I understand them to be at this time the video is released. So kind of keep that in mind. So what are the benefits of choosing a low-class provider? If they're so cheap, how come everybody doesn't use them? Um, well, the financial advantages would be they're less expensive. Um, so, you know, something like, and I'll put up the uh, chart here, providers like IceDrive, able to provide cost per gigabyte per month of 005990. And let me make sure that's correct. Yes, it is. Um, where AWS S3, their cost per gigabyte is going to be 0 0.02333. So significantly more expensive. And then Microsoft Azure, is going to be 0 0.21000. Again, take a look at the chart. Um, and so they're not going to be as feature rich. They're not going to be a complete ecosystem. You can't do AI on those. You can't typically do AI on them. They're pure storage. Now, that's all they do. They can provide you with object storage and block storage and file storage. Um, and they provide you with access to an expandable array of storage based on what you need. But as far as, you know, a complete suite of stuff where you're looking at a console and seeing thousands of services that are offered by, you know, someone like AWS and Microsoft and even Google, um, you know, and of course they're in the running here as well, is just not going to be the case. So um, simplicity normally, this is going to be an easy way to leverage storage, um, ease of use setup. Normally you can get going with these things with a few minutes and a credit card. It uh, doesn't cost a lot to start. Normally, they'll give you a free tier. Just try it out until you're happy with it, and then you can add uh, add a subscription plan on top of it. And they have uh, uh, focus features, um, and they do basic stuff. They do file sharing. They do encryption, um, stuff you need to deal with with storage. And they're designed to work with other systems. They understand they're not going to be your only cloud provider. And so they're going to provide you with a capability to provide you a niche service, but they understand you're going to be working with other compute services, on-prem services, desktops, and they're catering normally to small businesses that are very cost conscious. So this chart is interesting too, the cost per gigabyte per month um, versus, versus provider. Again, this is just graphing the chart I had earlier. Ice Drive, AWS S3, and Microsoft Azure. You know, as you can see, Ice Drive is... Uh, Probably about one fourth, a little less than one fourth, the price of AWS S uh, S3, and uh, Azure is a little cheaper than S3, but not much. So, when do you use these guys? When do you opt for less expensive providers over AWS, Microsoft? I guess even putting Google is in the less expensive category for this one, uh, which kind of it's a bit of an outlier, but it's interesting that that's what occurred. You look at your budget constraints, uh, primarily concern for small businesses. They may not need AWS services other than storage. And so using a lower cost storage provider, even of a provider that only supports their particular country that they're in, in other words, a sovereign cloud, and using these micro cloud providers to provide these systems provides better cost and to benefit. And as long as they're able to provide the service and the performance you need and the encryption you need and the basic services that you're looking to leverage, is perfectly fine. And so you're gonna find that in many instances that these storage providers are gonna be perfectly acceptable uh, and they're gonna bring more value back to the business because you're gonna be able to use them at a, at a much more lower cost. You have to look at specific use cases. Are these for personal use or smaller projects? I do see a lot of these uh, micro cloud providers, storage cloud providers that are lower cost supporting uh, the retail market, you know, more so than businesses, supporting individuals, you know, people that are storing stuff, uh, for whatever reason, it could be backup and recovery. It could be, um, you know, just offboarding their data systems. It could be sharing information across systems. That's what I do here with Dropbox, and other things that are uh, that are um, important to them. And also privacy priorities. Users prioritize the encryption and privacy. Almost all of these providers, I think all of them, provide some sort of encryption services, which is going to be table stakes. In other words, not only can I put my data there, but I can encrypt it. Uh, why it's on that particular cloud provider? Only I hold the key and can de-encrypt my data. And so that makes a lot of people who are using cloud-based storage feel a lot better since you're turning over your data. It could be very, you know, could be very uh, sensitive data, PI information, credit card information in the case of a small business. 
and you have to be relatively assured that it's going to be secure. So also the specific countries that they're, they're in, and uh, you may see a few of these providers only support a particular country. I think one of them is in New Zealand. Uh, uh, and that may be uh, important to you. So in other words, you are dealing with a country uh, with a sovereign cloud that works in only a particular one particular country or a couple countries that understand the data residency is compliant within regional regulations. So they know how to deal with the regulations of the particular countries that they're in. Europe, for example, has some very interesting ways in which they deal with uh, data sovereignty. Uh, it's easier to deal with a cloud provider that only supports the European countries because they're very aware and they have the facilities to make you comply within these systems. So you have to make sure that the data is accessible, accessible in the geographical regions, you know, that you're looking to leverage. In other words, if you're only in the United States and having a data service that supports the United States and you're able to use it with lower latency, um, that's perfectly fine. But if you're going to be an international company, and you need points of presence that are all over the world, supporting Asia, uh, you know, Europe, um, United States, South America, uh, then you're going to have to consider other options. And that's why people typically go to the bigger cloud providers is because they have points of presence basically all over the world. That doesn't mean you can't use servers in any of the United States when you're in Australia, but the latency is typically going to be an issue there. So you're looking for something that's going to be local to you, so you're able to get to the server uh, and use so in a, in a way that's going to be acceptable performance. Next would be service accessibility. Um, you got to remember you have to access the service. We just talked about that. So people like uh, companies like Ice Drive provide international services, but does not specify uh, regional data centers that they use. Uh, so they're telling you they, they're able to support you internationally but aren't going to tell you where your points of presence are, so you don't know exactly how the latency is going to predict. And so my advice to you is to use a free tier of the service and test it in all the places where you're going to use it and see what kind of uh, performance you're getting. Uh, Sync.com, they're focused primarily in North America, but of course they're accessible globally. Um, and then PETA, uh, pCloud, uh, based in Switzerland, they benefit from robust privacy laws of those systems. And but they do offer global access with a focus on European users. Again, sovereign cloud support everybody all around the world. You can certainly leverage them uh, from an international presence, but you have to kind of understand what the latency is going to be in doing that. Mega offer widespread availability, uh, but they cater particularly to uh, European and New Zealand users, given its regional compliance uh, focus there. And so, uh, again. This may be an instance where if you're in New Zealand and uh, you have a European presence and a New Zealand presence, this may be a better option for you because we're able to provide lower latency because of the points of presence. But again, test it yourself. Um, I'm just speculating at this point as to what the performance are, uh, performances for these systems. I did not test them, did not fly around the country to do ping tests on these particular storage providers. So you have to test them yourself. And then finally, Google Drive benefits from, you know, of course, Google's points of presence all over the place with uh, regional data centers. Uh, they're able to provide compliance and low latency. Pretty easy to test. Uh, you can, I, I believe, start out with Google with a free tier, um, but they're going to have points of presence all over the world because they're Google. And so this would be a very cheap, inexpensive uh, storage system that would... Uh, uh, have a much more better point of presence if you're looking to create an international infrastructure where stuff is existing all over the all over the planet. So you got to choose these things based on regional needs. So in other words, where your businesses are going to be, where the applications are going to be, where the consumers of the data are going to be, and understanding the performance and latency requirements and security requirements that exist within a particular country. So people have a tendency to pick the higher end cloud providers, AWS, Microsoft, and Google. Because of that, in other words, they're you know very good at supporting international clients, and I think that's going to be the case. But you're going to pay for it. Um, it looks like it looks like four times in many instances more than some of these providers are able to charge. So keep an eye on your regulations, keep an eye on your latency, keep an eye on your points of presence. Understand where your business is now, where your use cases are going to be now, and what they're going to be in the future. You're going to be adding offices all over the world. You're going to leverage this as your central storage cloud. Uh, you need to understand the latency 
uh, you know, the latency limitations and even some pricing differentiators that, that may be there and some regulation stuff to make sure you're making the right choices or else you're going to use a micro cloud for storage and end up migrating it back into a larger cloud at some later time, which is perfectly fine. Uh, so that shouldn't be a huge hassle in doing stuff like that, uh, in, especially when your needs change. But understand that that's going to occur and plan for it. So what was surprising to me is that just the number of cloud storage out options that are out there with the whole micro cloud world. And also the price that you can get many of these storage options. It's like I said, it's almost free uh, in many instances. You have to pay money for it, obviously, but they're very generous in their ability to provide you with lots of cloud storage for a greatly reduced price. In some cases, uh, competitive with you buying physical storage. Um, so it's going to be an interesting take on these things in terms and by the way uh, comment down below in terms of how if you worked with any of these players what you found out uh, you know share it with the rest of the group you need to understand that the best choice here deals with your specific needs uh, your budget security integration all these things and plan for growth in other words your existing usage of data storage uh, in the cloud is going to be here and then in five years where are you going to be uh, is going to be more of an international presence. What about regulations, utilization of AI-based systems for training data, uh, your ability to have access to the data, uh, latency needs. And also there is a bit of a risk, and some of these are very small co uh, companies, that they're either going to go out of business or get bought by a bigger company, uh, and their their model may change, even uh, discontinuing the service that you're dependent upon. And we saw that back uh, 2010, 2013, when lots of the existing new clouds that were uh, were created, in many cases just providing storage, uh, went away, and people were left holding the bag and had to switch shift shift uh, quickly to another cloud provider, which is going to be disruptive. I'm not saying any of these are going to do that, but you always have to factor that in as a potential risk uh, in leveraging a provider that's not as uh, as name brand as as not as large as some of the larger providers are out there. So assess your own storage needs and select the provider that aligns your priorities. Uh, sounds like a cop out, but I think that's the right uh, way to think about this. So anyway, I'd love to get your thoughts below. Um, you know what you think about this kind of content. If you want more reviews like this where we're looking at lower cost solutions, I, I kind of found this kind of fun uh, because I learned things myself. I didn't know about any of the providers other than Google. And it was interesting to kind of dig into what they're able to do and what those lower cost storage providers are able to provide. And it's pretty impressive based on your cost that they're charging you. So that's all I have this week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, don't forget to check out my InfoWorld blog. Also, check out my generative AI architecture course out on Go Cloud Careers. We're having a lot of fun there. Check us out. Join me over there two hours a week, live, uh, live teaching uh, and uh, something 30, 40 uh, hours of videos that are out there. So it's it's uh, it's fairly useful. And certainly understanding a topic like generative AI, you're going to need that time uh, to figure it out, how it's done and how it works. And I'm happy to teach you. Also, my LinkedIn learning courses, 70 were out there. Just added an agentic AI course and an update to the generative AI courses coming and update to the architecture courses. Um, happy to participate there. I get a lot of great feedback on those. So check those out. Also, don't forget my book, Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing, where we talk about a lot of the things we're talking about on this, on this show. And uh, until next time, you guys stay real safe. Cheers. Bye.